I learned a great question recently. In Canada, we say, how are you? And um, I'm not sure that we really care, but we ask that question. I learned a new question in the last three weeks, and it's very similar, and it's Canadian. It's how are you today? How are you today? Yeah, that's good. You know, there's, when you're going through something, there's a, there's a daily processing. When you're emotionally, whether struggling or dealing with crisis or change, there's a daily processing. And sometimes there's an hourly processing. And sometimes there's a moment-by-moment moment processing. Three weeks ago, I preached a sermon. I don't remember what it was because it feels like it was a year ago. And after that service, I had a phone call. Some of you know this already, but I want to bring everyone else kind of into the space we're in. I had a phone call from the, the president of Foursquare Canada, and he told me that we had to have a meeting immediately. Now, right after you preach a sermon, when the president of Foursquare Canada calls and says we need to meet immediately, it's not yippee. And I remember saying on the phone, could you give me a heads up what this is about? Because this is going to be a long 15 minutes before I see you. He said, no, I can't. Now, as you can imagine, the stress level, the dread, the fear and anxiety just kind of rises up. To make a long story short, we met and he, he, he notified me that our lead pastor, Pastor Barry Buzza, would no longer be the lead pastor of Northside Church. This is a decision they had made. And I would be the interim lead pastor. And in that moment, I'm not going to share any more details than that. If you, if you want more details, you can speak to myself, Rose, or Pastor Jen after the service. Because I actually, it's not important for this sermon. Because what I want to hone in on is the emotion, the feelings, the thoughts of processing something huge in our lives. Not only processing something huge in our lives, but processing loss. By the way, Pastor Barry is alive. Him and Susan are in the States, and we've been in contact, and they're, they're doing as well as can be. So, Pastor Barry did not pass away for those that might go there. But there's something about loss, sudden loss, that I wanted to speak about. And the next few weeks, I'm going to, I'm not going to preach. I, there might be a little teaching, but there's going to be sharing as well. So can I have grace from you for that? Thank you. The reason I want to share and not just preach is because sharing takes you deeper into the experience of what's actually happening to all of us. Now, when I started processing what I was feeling, and I, I would spend countless nights awake, 20 hours a day, I'd sleep for a few hours at night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, I would be constantly processing, constantly worrying, constantly anxious. 
about all of you. All of you. And the question I kept asking is, what are we going to do now? This wasn't in the plans. This wasn't in the the seven-year plan. It was unexpected. It was shock. It was absolute shock waves for a lot of us. And I began to realize about halfway through the last few weeks that what I'm actually processing is grief. Grief, a loss in my own life and in our lives. And so while grief is usually associated with the death of a loved one or a friend, It can also be the way that we deal with the loss of a significant relationship, the loss of a dream, the loss of a leader in our lives. Now for some of us, there's a a burying type of grief. It's where we, we don't grieve outwardly, but instead we, we bury it so deep within us, we don't even know it's there. People ask, how are you doing? I'm fine. We get so busy with other things, we become so distracted with the busyness of life that we just sort of act like nothing has actually happened. And for some of us in this room, that's the way you're dealing with loss in this season. There's another kind of grief that instead of a burying grief deep within us, it's a bursting grief. It's outwardly emotional, at times angry. We might hit things. We might just cry into a pillow as loud as we possibly can. It's, a, it's an outward demonstration of grief. That's called being Italian. <laughs> but whether it's a burying grief or a bursting grief, whether it's an internal processing or an external processing, the danger is when we, we have unhealthy patterns in our life around that grief. One of those unhealthy patterns is denial. Another unhealthy pattern is just constant anxiety and discouragement and depression. For some, there's unhealthy processing as we... You know, we we might act out at our family. We might just ignore our family. For some, there's substance abuse. There's patterns and things in our life that we just begin to do things that are not healthy. Some of us just take a lot of risks in life financially or whatever it may be. It's, It's when this internal or external grief that we're processing, it's when that leads to behavior that is unhealthy, that's when it's bad grief. And so today I want to talk about the normal processes of grief. I've also realized over the past few weeks that grief has a unique way of actually reminding us of the influence of a person's life. that people that influence our lives actually take up residence within us. People that influence our lives, they take up space in our emotions, in our thoughts, in our prayers. It's almost like important people in our life, they kind of move into our inner world and they live there. And, and when we lose these people, whether it's through, through death or circumstances, and, and they're not there anymore, it's like, whew, it creates this space 
within us that is now empty. And we don't know what to do with that empty space. Previously, we would think about this person. We would emotionally be connected to them. Because they occupied space within us, there would be this stable trust that so-and-so is in my life and they mean so much to me and they're a stability to me. Someone I can go to. Someone that can be strong for me. And what happens when we lose these influential people in our lives is it creates a space in our emotions, in our thoughts, sometimes in our prayers, and, and there's this instability created. And, and grief has a way of bringing up the memory of these people in our lives, just how much they mean to us, meant to us. But what happens is, is if that space isn't occupied by healthy things, thoughts, emotions, healthy people, good conversations, then the enemy will fill that space with garbage. If we weren't online right now, I'd use a different word. Because he will want to fill that space with just about the worst thoughts and the worst habits And what I felt the Lord saying to us is wherever we're at and whatever that space looks like is Jesus can fill that space. That Jesus can actually be okay with all of our emotions and all of our thoughts and all of our processing. That Jesus can move into that space and he can sit there. Psalm 34 verse 18 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He's near. He comes into the space. So where there's this, if you imagine a brokenhearted, brokenheartedness has this space, right? Because it's been broken. And Jesus is near to that space. He's near to that place. And he saves the crushed in spirit. The crushed in spirit. And so good grief involves an understanding that Jesus is in the void. He's in the space. And if we don't process grief with Jesus, it's dangerous. This isn't um, part of my notes, but there's, um, I'm just gonna say it the way it is. I've been hearing of a, of a, a lot of gossip swirling around. And trying to rid the church of gossip is like trying to rid the church of people. I get it. Where there is people, there will be gossip. But I want you to imagine that gossip can be good gossip. And gossip can absolutely destroy lives. And I haven't prepared anything eloquent around this topic. All I know is that gossip can destroy innocent bystanders easier than an atom bomb. And we have to imagine that the words we speak, as James says, there is life and death. Life and death is in what? The power of the tongue. And so I would just encourage you in the coming weeks and in the coming months to speak truth and to ask yourself, 
Are these words life-giving or not? Because our words will lead to many more funerals of sorts that don't need to be there. And at those funerals that our words can create, it won't be grief, it'll be regret. That was for free, not in the notes. Pastoral counseling. We believe that pastoral counseling is not an opportunity to solve problems. This is my own thoughts now. Pastoral counseling is not an opportunity for me to somehow solve your problem. Pastoral counseling for me is to help people understand their problems. And then, in light of their relationship with God, invite Christ in to minister to people in those areas. So if you sign up for pastoral counseling, looking forward to it, it's not though a quick, just solve the problem, it's to help you see the problem and to invite Jesus into that place. It's really hard to have pastoral counseling if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. (laughs) Because I'm trying to get out of the way so you can see Jesus and hear from Jesus personally. My goal of counseling is to get out of the way and let Jesus minister to you. My goal of inner healing is to get out of the way and let Jesus minister to you. There are seven stages of grief that I want to speak about today. And and there was five stages of grief back in the, I think, 60s. This first came out. But there's a couple more that I wanted to highlight for us. This is not step by step, and this is not linear. The stages of grief are fluid, and we can go back and forth into different stages at different times. Not everyone processes the same. Not everyone processes the same speed and the same stages at the same time. But the first stage of grief is shock and denial. Shock and denial. I remember sitting there and, and just you know, hearing about what's going on. I remember being just, dis, just disbelief, just absolute shock, like this, this an unwillingness to accept an unwillingness to accept the information. And, and this is an unwillingness to accept the loss of a loved one, possibly. It's that moment when you find out and there's just, no, it can't be. It, it just can't be. This is not happening. Like, this is not, ha- it's that shock and that denial. It's also a way that we sometimes deny the severity of the situation. This isn't that bad. It's not really that serious. Why is everyone so worked up? This isn't that serious. That will often happen in the first stage of grief, this denial at the severity of the situation. Sometimes this happens with the loss of a dream. Maybe you had a dream of becoming a medical doctor but you, you know, failed the boards or the final test. Maybe you wanted to be an Olympic athlete. Maybe you wanted to be a professional athlete, a concert pianist or something else, or you wanted that job, you know, that job that, and, and just, you went after it, you went after it, you went after it, and then you realize you're never going to get it. Well, there's, there's a grief, a shock and denial that comes in at any loss. Loss of a dream, loss of a loved one. Loss of a leader. The second stage of grief that we move into, and again, these aren't linear, is pain and guilt. It's this sobbing sadness at the feeling of loss. There's also what creeps in in this stage, and this is really sad because it's, it's a stage that I think a lot of us have felt the last 10 days or so, with me it's been three weeks, but 
there's a self-doubt actually that comes in. The guilt that we feel is this, I should have done more. I should have done more, I should have been there more, I should have called more, I should have, I've heard this a few times, I should have prayed more. We, we actually take, in, in times of grief, we actually take on a responsibility for what has happened in someone else's life. This is part of being a community and loving each other. I should have prayed more. If I just prayed more, I, I, this wouldn't have happened. The third stage is anger and bargaining. Why is this happening to this person? Why did this person get hit by a car? Why did this person die from terminal cancer? Why, why, why? Anger. It's also a bargaining that comes in. The bargaining is if they just come back, everything is gonna be okay. If this just happens or that just happens or that, if it's almost like we're unable to deal with the loss so we begin bargaining, oh, if I can just, if that just happens and that happens, I'll be all right. Why? Because that void within us is empty and we want it filled with that person or that dream. The fourth stage is, I just wanna say, I know this is heavy, but if we do not process it all, that will be really unhealthy for us. Depression. I've heard this a lot. I was actually meeting with a pastor this past week and his response to the news was, I can't even read my Bible. I can't work. I don't want to even move. This is a tough part. This is a tough part of grief because it's, I'm not talking, by the way, when I say depression, I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm not talking about depression related to other things. I'm not talking about diagnosed depression. I'm talking about depression around grief, okay? Because some will be like, you don't even know what I'm going through. Like, it's, it's around grief. And what happens is, is this depression, it, we're frozen, we can't move, we don't wanna go out, we don't wanna see people, we wanna crawl into a hole, we just wanna be hidden from everything and depression sits in and it's this paralyzed state of not wanting to do anything. Many of us have gone through this. Now, the beauty of, of this stage of grief, there is a beauty about the depression stage of grief, and again, I'm only referring to the beauty of depression stage of grief, not depression, okay? I know this is sensitive, and I know there's lots of people struggling and wrestling through depression but I'm talking about this momentary around grief. What happens in this stage is reflection and purpose actually begin to creep in. We spend so much time processing that eventually we actually take a slight turn toward the better right at the end of this depression stage. And the verse that comes to mind is Isaiah 33 verse six. He, God, will be the stability of your times. He will be the stability of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. 
The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. And so what happens as we come toward the end of this depression state is we realize and we recognize, A, we can't get through it, like we'll never get through it, but God is our stability. And it's this recognition that God is with us, he is near the brokenhearted, and he will be my stability when I can't stand. He will be the one that helps me go to work when I don't want to go to work. He will be the one that meets me in the word when I finally open up my Bible and I can read the Bible again and I can pray again. Like, have it, have, I just want to be honest here. Have, have any of you sat down to pray in the last few weeks and there's just been nothing? Like, just anyone difficulty praying? Anyone difficulty reading your Bible the last 10 days? Anyone? A couple people. And it's in this moment that we actually begin to move into what's called the fifth stage of grief, which is the upward turn. The upward turn. This is the moment where we realize that life has to continue. It has to start again. It's like a scene in a movie where the main character kind of wakes up and he, I'm just gonna say he, because most of the time I see men in this scene, it's the guy wakes up and he's got like piles of pop cans and like stale Cheetos and pizza boxes and video game controller covered in grease and the TV is kind of flickering with like black and white, you know, this, this scene where, where like the prodigal wakes up and he's like, ugh, and he's like usually got like Cheeto stains on his shirt and his beer gut is hanging out and he's like, okay, I better get like my life back on track. This is the upward turn. He gets up, he cleans the space, right? He cleans it all. He throws out the garbage, he vacuums, and he takes a shower, and he shaves, and he puts on an outfit, and he says, today I'm going to go, and I'm going to get a job. It's that moment in the movie. We've seen it, right? This is the upward turn. The upward turn is the phrase, it's going to be Okay. Now, if you're not at that stage, right in this moment, you're upset at me. And that's when you know you're not quite there because you don't want to think about it's going to be okay. You don't want to think about the upward turn. But it will come. It'll be different for all of us. Our process will be different but there will become a time where it's going to be okay. And now we begin the last two stages of grief. The sixth stage is reconstruction and working through. You see, in the basement right now, we've, we've demolished a lot. Probably about 80% of the basement, we've done all the demolishing that we need to do to begin the reconstruction. You can't reconstruct until you demolish. You can't put up new walls until you've taken down the old walls. It's impossible to rush this. It's impossible to, to rebuild on a cracky foundation. And currently in the basement, we're gonna be addressing the mechanical systems, the electrical systems, structural walls, and the space is gonna be beautiful but we still have to fix some cracks in the foundation. There's actually water that is coming up through the basement slab in the kids' auditorium. There's a crack right on that wall, right, right where you're sitting. <laughs> there is a, a small way that water's getting into the building. We'd be silly to just start rebuilding without addressing the water. We'd be silly to just start rebuilding without addressing the cracks in the foundation. 
And so in this, in this step of reconstruction and working through, this is where we begin the work of rebuilding. And the last stage is acceptance and hope. It's actually, I'm at peace with what happened. And I can now focus on what will happen tomorrow instead of what, will hap- what has happened in the past. And I want to encourage you that, I was reminded of the story of where Jesus, in John chapter 11, this isn't in your notes, where Jesus goes to Mary and Martha to comfort them. Lazarus has died. Jesus wasn't there when he died. But he goes to see them. And what's interesting is both Martha and Mary have a bargaining statement in their grief. They say to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Mary as well says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is that bargaining. This is that moment of if this just happened, then that would have happened. Jesus, if you were just here, then that would not have happened. And then there's this beautiful verse. This is the shortest verse in the English New Testament. Jesus wept. It says that Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And they invite him to come and see where Lazarus is. And it says Jesus wept. In my mind, I'm going, why would Jesus have wept? He's just going to raise him up. He's just going to resurrect Lazarus. If I was Jesus, I would have smiled. I would have been like, wait until you see this. Why did Jesus weep? Because Jesus was processing grief. Jesus, even knowing the end, it will be okay. Even though he knew the end of the story, he still processed, he was deeply troubled, sorrowful. Jesus wept, Jesus wept. I'm gonna skip ahead. I wanna just share something that the Lord shared to me in the last few weeks. While I was up in the middle of the night, each of us has coping mechanisms, things that we do in situations like this, healthy and unhealthy, with people or alone. What I was doing in the middle of the night, this is my coping mechanism. It's gonna sound sad, maybe pathetic, but what I did in the middle of the night, every night, was write sermons and vision cast. Every night, vision casting. Where are we going? What are we doing? Every single night, goals, objectives. Like, it was like the mad scientist. There's like papers everywhere, and all I'm doing is trying to just figure out this question, what are we going to do now? And a couple weeks into that, I woke up with this sense, why am I trying to fix the church? Why am I trying to, what am I trying to fix? I can't fix this. And the Lord said, grief cannot be fixed, it can only be processed. And the next thought I had is, grief is not like my tractor. Last year, I had an issue with my tractor. I would, I would turn it on, and it would be good for about 30 minutes, and then it would shut off. And then I would turn it on, and it would last for one minute, and then shut off. I would turn it on, and then it would shut off. Turn it on, shut it off. 
So I was given about 30 minutes of, of work with the tractor, you know, dumping manure, and then it would just shut off. And I didn't know where it was going to shut off. It could have been midway through dumping the manure, and then all this, it was just such a pain. So I changed the oil. I did research on Google. By the way, John Deere, they do not share how to fix their tractors. <laughs> they honestly don't. I found this out. They will not put it on YouTube. They, you can't find it anywhere. You have to take it to them. But I will not pay $400 an hour to John Deere. I can figure this out. So I'm trying to fix this tractor day after day. I have no idea. I'm not even good with cars. So you can imagine what I was trying on this tractor. I kicked it. I did the oil. I did the oil. I put in, uh, you know, hydraulic fluid, even though that had nothing to do with the issue. I greased it. I washed it. It still wasn't fixed. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. And then, so I called up someone that does know what he's doing, Gary Goddard. He knows a lot about tractors. And I said, Gary, you got to come over here. And so he came over, bless his heart. I, I wrestled with it for about six months because I'm, well, prideful. Um, and then I finally called him, right? And the, my biggest fear was that he was going to show up and just be like, ta-da, ta-da. You know, and then it would just be fixed. That was my biggest fear. So I really, it took me a long time just to pick up the phone because I wanted to make sure that I had tried every option so I wouldn't be embarrassed when Gary came over. But he said, you got to check the fuel line. I said, where's the fuel line? <laughs> I mean, I'm, the, I'm just, I'm not a great farmer. I know some of you are breaking your hearts right now, but... I just, now I know where the fuel line is. So I checked the fuel line. I checked for blockage in it. There wasn't. I then drained the whole tank. And I realized right in the bottom of the gas tank, this is a sermon analogy for another sermon as well. Right in the bottom of the gas tank where the fuel goes in was all clogged with gunk. So I had to drain the fuel out. I cleaned it all out. I actually vacuumed out the bottom of my gas tank because it was sediment that was getting into the fuel line and so fuel wasn't running through properly and it would shut off. Filled it back up, turned it on. It's run, run beautiful ever since. We fixed it. Do you know this moment when you fix something that you've been fighting with for months? It's just so awesome. It's like you feel like you're on top of the world. Um, but grief isn't like a tractor that can be fixed. You can't just find out what the issue is and fix it. It's actually more like a green peppercorn sauce that has to be processed. We make a sauce in our house that is uh, for steak, mainly for tenderloin. Sorry to do this at 1115. But uh, basically it involves, I might get some ingredients wrong. My, my mom will call me right after this sermon if I do. But, you know, you brown some shallots. You get the shallots going and you brown them really nice. You get green uh, peppercorns in brine. We, get them at, we used to get them at William and Sonoma in the States, but they got to be in brine. And you cut those up and you, you mix that together with the shallots. Then you put in some stock. And then you cook that for about an hour because the stock has to reduce. And then you add the brandy. You don't drink any yourself because you're a pastor. You put it in the sauce. And then you reduce that for an hour. Then you put in some cream. You reduce that for an hour little bit of Dijon mustard. It's magnificent. It's really, really good. And the reason it's really, really good is because it's been fully processed. Sauce from a package at Savon is not the same as sauce that's been processed and reduced. There's a certain flavor 
in sauce that has been properly processed that you can't get anywhere else. Grief is the same. It's a process. It's a process that you go through, loss of a loved one, loss of a dream, loss of a leader. You go through day after day with community. And at the end, God is going to do something miraculous here. If all the ingredients stay. It will be a miraculous ending to what he's begun in this difficult season. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are our living hope. Thank you that, Father, you help us to see into the night. Thank you, Father, that you help us to hope that even in this season, Lord, of grief and loss and difficulty, that you are doing something in us, Lord, among us, through us, that will have purpose, Lord. So I pray that as we process together, you would anoint our conversations, our interactions, the things we do and the things we say, Lord. Bless our time of prayer, our time of worship, that Jesus, we would leave every meeting saying Jesus was here. You are welcome in our praise, welcome in our prayer, welcome in our messages, welcome in our every meeting we have, Jesus. We want you to be the center of it all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.